very good morning and uh, thank you very much for the kind invite. I am a hardcore clinician. I am not an MBA or an administrator of any sorts. I pride myself on being a doctor. And what I am going to speak to you from the heart of what I have seen over the last 40 years of the suffering of uh, the patients in this country. What I would like to do in the next 20 minutes or so that is allocated to me is uh, briefly talk to you about the challenges and burden faced by the country because of the unaffordable and inaccessible health care, the potential solutions which are basically making health care affordable to the masses and reduce the cost of uh, health care. And in the last couple of slides, I will summarize what I had said. Unfortunately, in spite of our economic growth, we have done very, very poorly in the health index in almost every parameter, not only compared to the developed world, but also the developing world. If you can look at some of the parameters, we have a dismal spending on health, both private and public sector, and of this, the spending by the government is abysmally low, less than 1.5%. And of course, uh, life expectancy is 66, better than what it was many years ago, but still less, lesser than some of the developing world. Extremely high infant mortality and maternal mortality rates, which are an index of how well we deliver health care to our masses. Now, who is responsible for this dismal state of health care is the big million dollar question, and I am sure. Uh, uh, Mrs. Rao's book will answer some of these questions. I will reserve my comments for the time being. Even though access to health care should be as fundamental a right of every citizen as the right to vote, be educated and have food, the sad story is a large percentage of our citizens still do not have access or cannot afford health care even today in 2017. That is the sad state of affairs of our uh, health care system in the country today. It is almost like if I told someone that you cannot vote, you do not have the right to vote, you have been disenfranchised, or we tell people that you do not have food to eat, you die of starvation. That would be big news, major news in the, uh, all the TV channels and of course in all the newspapers. But if uh, people die because they do not have access to health care, it doesn't become major news. I think it should be given the same importance. In, to me, it's a fundamental right. So if you do not have access to health care in this country, I think it's a shame, just like if you didn't have the right to vote. And we have the right to vote, but uh, we do not have the right for health care for the vast majority in our country. Why is this happening? It's a combination of poor availability, high cost, unpredictable quality of health care delivery for the marginalized population, which almost is the population of Europe and America put together. Inadequate quality of services at government hospitals. Uh, I'm sure most of you would not want to visit a government hospital except some of the premier institutes in the country where the service is reasonable. Because of the poor, uh, poor service of the government hospitals, many are forced to go in for private hospitals, which unfortunately are unaffordable to the folks at the low end of the pyramid. This is the worst in the rural areas. The, the ratio of rural population to doctors is six times lower than the urban areas. Fifty percent of the posts are obstetricians, pediatricians, gynecologists in primary health, community health centers are vacant in our country. Over 30 percent of the rural population in India have to travel 30 kilometers to get medical treatment. All of you would have seen the very, very sad state where uh, some person was carrying his child eight kilometers on his shoulders to get medical treatment and ultimately the child died by the time he reached the hospital. Worse still, one of uh, the villages in one of the eastern parts of India had to carry his mother's dead body in a sack for 12 kilometers because we were not able to provide an ambulance for this gentleman. That this happens in India is truly, truly shameful and I think that's not acceptable. Over 65% of the rural population in India lack access to preventive medicines. The other major thing that has happened in our country is that uh, we, even though we are a developing nation, we have diseases of the developed world and the developing country. We have not yet com uh, conquered communicable diseases like malaria, TB, H1N1, so on and so forth. 
but we are also hit by lifestyle diseases like diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and heart disease in a big way. There's a huge gap between what we have and what we need. Around 2 million gap in bed capacity, 2 million shortfall in doctors and nurses. Uh, India has about a, four, 400 medical colleges, I'm sure ma'am is very familiar with most of them. Uh, offers close to 50,000 medical seats. We need to produce a million doctors every year and there's a lack of specialists. Even then with the doctors who are trained because there's a huge gap between the postgraduate and undergraduate seats. And here are some figures of the huge, huge uh, gap that we have as compared to the developed world. America has 25 times more cardiologists per population than India has. And as you can see, the ratio is uh, anywhere between 7 to 25 times more number of doctors for a given population in the U.S. as compared to India. Why has this happened? To me, this cartoon explains it all. This is my favorite cartoon. This is a champagne glass, all of which uh, you are very familiar with. And what has happened is the richest have taken all the luxuries in this world. Whether it is wealth, health care, power, resources, whatever it is, it's controlled by the top 20% of the people. And many of you might have read that the top richest 100 people in the world have GDPs more than many of the developed countries. And this is what has happened, just like economic inequality, there's a huge inequality in the distribution and delivery of health care. The rich can afford it, the poor certainly cannot, and this has to be changed. We have to have a level, level playing field for the rich and the poor. One of the saddest moments of a doctor, which I realized soon after I came back from the U.S., is to tell a patient that you have a disease that's treatable, but not affordable in your case, and I condemn you to die. And this is what happens, really. I mean, we don't tell them we condemn you to die, but that's essentially the implication of what happens. Uh, many of you might have read the sad story of a young kid, three-year-old kid from Uttar Pradesh or Bihar, who was taken to a doctor, a kidney specialist in Mumbai, who told them that the kid, boy needs a kidney transplantation. It will cost you some four or five lakhs. So the father said, I'll bring the kid back tomorrow for admission. He took the kid, went back home, and on the way, as he was crossing the river, he threw the kid out of the bridge. Because he knew that he couldn't afford the five lakhs, he thought it might as well get rid of the kid rather than uh, go through the torture of both financial and health uh, issues that the kid had. So the kid fortunately had, uh, was a very lucky kid, probably a blessed kid. The kid actually was thrown out of the bridge but landed on a fisherman's lap who was uh, on a boat under the bridge. And the kid was saved, then it became major news in all the news channels. And then thousands of people, including the government from which the kid came from, offered free health care for this patient for the entire uh, uh, disease process that was needed. So this was a sort of happy ending, but that happens once in a blue moon. The rest of them really, really die. I was very shocked when a senior nephrologist uh, that I knew very well, and I was sitting with him when I first came to India, and uh, when a poor patient came to him with severe kidney failure, he would say, uh, you are looking good, go home, drink four tender coconut waters a day. And many of you who are probably familiar with kidney disease know that uh, tender coconut water is extremely rich in potassium, and people with kidney disease cannot excrete potassium in the, from the body, so they accumulate potassium. Potassium becomes very high, and the heart stops beating. So essentially, it was assisted suicide, and it was a painless way to go. And he said, uh, look here, uh, young man, if I, this was about uh, 25 years ago when I was still young, uh, he said, look here, if I tell him that he has dialysis, transplantation, then he'll be worried where I'm going to get the money from, and then he and his family will be ruined. Here, at least, you'll have a peaceful death. And that still happens in this country, unfortunately. We are a land of contradictions. We have the most expensive house next to the largest slum in the world, in Mumbai. We gave the world Mahatma Gandhi, but one of the most corrupt nations in the world. We have some of the best modern hospitals, but have one of the highest maternal infant mortality rates. We do robotic surgery, complex heart, kidney, liver surgery, stem cell transplants in luxurious operating room suites or seven-star hospitals. And there are kids dying of malnutrition, gastroenteritis in this hospital next, uh, next door. More than a million kids die every year because uh, of uh, malnutrition, poor sanitation, so on and so forth. Our challenges really are not bringing modern health care to the country that's available in our country in uh, many, many centers. 
But the problem is making it affordable and accessible to the vast majority of citizens in this country. Just to give you an example, in my own field, we have uh, some of the best centers for kidney disease in this country. But more than 95% of the people with severe kidney disease, which is almost 200,000 people a day, die every year because care is not affordable or available. More than 80% of the kidney specialists uh, in this country are in metros catering to less than 10% of the population. Just as our economic reforms has not touched the vast majority of the common man, the healthcare boom also so far has not touched the common man, and this is what needs to be changed. And this is certainly to me a very, very dangerous social trend. In the older days, if you had a serious disease, you died in the special ward of the hospital. If you were rich, because there was no treatment available. And if you were poor, you died in the general ward. Both of them died, but one in a little more comfort, other one in a less, less comfortable situation. However, now, because treatment is available, the rich get treated and go home healthy, but the poor go to the grave. And this is what has changed. And this, to me, is a serious issue. This, unfortunately, could be a very, very serious potential trigger for social unrest, just like extreme poverty was a trigger for naxalism to be born in the poorest of poor societies of this uh, country. So my, we are really blessed that our people are very tolerant. Otherwise, by now, we would have had a revolution where the poor would have demanded health care as well as the rich. And it's likely to happen unless this, change, this is changed by the society and by the government. What we need to do is we need to move the availability of health care from this to this. And I'm sure all of you are uh, aware of this bungalow, a billion dollar bungalow in Mumbai, and also a million dollar home slum in Mumbai. So we need to move the care from the select few to the vast majority. We certainly need, it, need to move it from the cities to the villages. And we need to move health care from seven star hospitals to the rural poor. And if that doesn't happen, we'll be forced to do it. How do we make healthcare affordable? There are two or three premises here. One is shift focus from tertiary and quaternary care in the cities to public health measures, preventive and primary health care. It is very, very inexpensive to prevent disease, awfully, awfully expensive to treat disease. Uh, there's a huge shortage of doctors in this country. So use nurse practitioners and physician assistants, which is even used in the US and developed world to overcome shortage of doctors in the rural areas because you really don't need a doctor for most of the day-to-day -day mundane healthcare issues. Go to the patient's homes rather than coming to the center. It's almost impossible for a working class person in a village to skip work for one or two days to come to the primary health center, spend the entire day, then go back. Not only will they lose their uh, income, they'll also be spending money on health care when they go there, which is a double whammy again. Use technology and other measures to reduce cost. Public-private partnership, especially my favorite theme is have a medical college hospital in every district of India, where anyway the government has a district uh, civil hospital, attach a medical college from a private sector, and use the medical college resources to build the facilities in that hospital. The best example of this is Government Wenlock Hospital in uh, Mangalore, which has been with the Kasturba Medical College uh, ever since I was a kid. And probably uh, Bangalore District and Udupi District have the lowest infant and maternal mortality rate in the country, equivalent to the developed world. Now, there's a huge uh, need for increasing the number of doctors. There's a huge need for upgradation of hospitals in the district level and taluka levels. Work on universal health coverage. And of course, there was a concept of universal basic income. I'm not too sure that you should pay money to everyone. I think you should pay money selectively to only to the people who need it. Move from caring for illness, which is a typical American tradition, to promotion of wellness with massive awareness blitz on preventive health, public health, and lifestyle modification. Increase healthcare spending. I think our healthcare spending by the government is less than 1.5% of the GDP which needs to be at least 5 to 6% uh, according to the experts. But that's not the, not the only answer. Uh, the United States spends over 18% of the GDP on healthcare, which is more than the D GDP of India. But I don't think that healthcare is still the best. There's a lot of lacunae there too. Prevention, prevention, and prevention is the key, rather than cure, cure, and cure. I think, uh, as the saying goes, an ounce of prevention prevents a 
ton of cure in my opinion. And it's a no-brainer that we should uh, invest in healthcare. A healthy population is the engine behind sustainable economic growth. And according to the United Nations and World Health Organization, non-communicable diseases will cost India in the region of $6.2 trillion, or almost three times our GDP between 2012 and 2013. It is very, very important that we move healthcare to the rural areas. There's a low availability of specialist service in rural India. There's a shortfall of 46% pediatricians, large number of other specialists in the rural areas, and certainly a large uh, deficit in the hospital beds available. And we should have strategies for increasing availability of specialist services in the rural public health facilities, increasing the number of trained specialists, I think there is a huge shortage uh, of postgraduate seats in this country. We should use the resources of the large private sector hospitals to train more people, as is currently being done by the national boards. Uh, monetary and non-monetary incentives for working in the rural areas. Uh, compulsory rural postings and rotations is debatable because I think it's always better to have a carrot rather than use the stick. I think incentivization, for instance, if you have a rural posting, you should probably get merit to get into postgraduate seats, jobs, whatever, or scholarships for your education. Public-private partnership, skill upgradation and supplementary training, especially of the non-doctors. Creating new cadres and use of information technology. As I said earlier, convert district hospitals into, attach them to a medical college, the services will definitely improve. Increase healthcare spending, I think this is an absolute must. Increase, India's healthcare is underfinanced and relies too heavily on out-of-pocket spending. I mean, healthcare is not expensive in India. Certainly, if you look at the uh, developed world, we uh, work at about 5 to 10 percent of the cost. But the problem is here you pay out-of-pocket. And if uh, people were to pay for dialysis in the U.S., out of pocket, I don't think a single person would be on dialysis in the U.S. It's entirely taken care of by the government as Medicare. According to India's draft national policy, the country's out of pocket expenditure for health is 60 percent and is one of the highest in the world. And a lot of people in the middle class, the lower middle class, actually become poor when they have an illness because of the health care expenses, as, as is mentioned here. Due to these out of pocket expenses, about 55 million Indians fell into the poverty trap. About 47% and 37% of hospital admissions in rural and urban India are financed by loans and sales of assets. And this is truly a sad story. I've seen many patients who start on dialysis. Unfortunately, many of them start in their most productive part of life. Initially, they have uh, used up their uh, savings. Then you see that they start coming in two-wheelers instead of cars. Then they, you see that the wife has less and less jewelry each time she comes to the hospital and sometimes they would have sold off their assets, their jewels and everything, and then finally they go bankrupt. Global evidence on health spending shows that unless a country spends at least 5 to 6 percent of its GDP on health, basic health care needs are seldom met. In India, public spending is dismally, dismally low. We should work very hard on insurance, uh, what I would say intelligent, smart insurance coverage for preventive health. We do have many government schemes, but unfortunately some of them are probably poorly planned, poorly regulated, and very poorly executed. Uh, some of the uh, fees and the uh, insurance rates are so low that if you're honest, you cannot use them. The only way you can make money is by claiming uh, insurance on surgeries that you've not done. And as has happened in some of the villages where I believe the number of hysterectomies were more than the number of women in that village. So obviously people have uh, charged uh, the insurance companies or the government for uh, surgeries that were not done. So I think we have to have a more intelligent way of ensuring the large number of people who need it, both the government, the patient, and the doctors and the medical centers should benefit from this. And I think by reducing costs, uh, what we see is uh, no offense meant to any of the companies, but I think many companies sort of uh, have an incremental uh, type of innovation where you change one carbon atom or one uh, nitrogen atom in a molecule and you get a patent for that and then no one can bring down the price for that drug for another 10 years. So I think this incremental innovation should be looked at. Certainly radical innovation is to come up with new thing is something that the world needs. Decrease customs duty on life-saving equipment. I am told that the custom duty on some, something as simple as a 
blood glucose monitoring slip is 18 to 25 percent. There's no reason for us to do that. Incentives for local equipment manufacturers, and I think we should uh, take the Prime Minister's Make in India program very seriously and see if we can uh, replace some of the equipment and the hardware uh, that we import and make it in India. Uh, introduction of generics is something I think most people are now talking about. The government is also talking about it, probably taking it seriously. There's a huge, huge difference between the price of uh, generic drugs and branded ones. And I think wherever it's considered safe and reliable, we should push for generic drugs. And uh, I am sure all of you are aware of uh, what's happening in the cardiac stent market these days. The government has taken the bold step of reducing the stent price by almost 80 to 90 percent, which in my opinion, by and large, is good for the patients as long as the benefit does get passed on to the patient. We have to focus on technological innovation uh, in the delivery of healthcare. Of course, uh, many of the hospitals, including us, have uh, employed technology, but we should look at more of technology that reduces the cost and helps the poor. Uh, I mean, we have introduced Watson, which we right now are doing it free. We have introduced robotics, so on and so forth. But unfortunately, some of these technologies have not actually reduced the cost of uh, healthcare. They are innovations, and they are probably better in some ways, but may not have reduced the cost of healthcare. But what we really need to look at is technology reducing the cost of healthcare and movement from brick and mortar hospitals to e health and m health to deliver healthcare. And in the technological innovations, we should look at remote monitoring devices for early detection and potential uh, treatment of medical emergencies. We have a concept of eICU, which we are looking at, uh, where uh, even peripheral uh, rural hospitals can manage an ICU with very little trained uh, doctors or paramedical personnel, with a command center being in one of the major uh, hospitals in the city. Uh, cardiac monitoring by EKG remotely transmitted to a treating physician can actually save a lot of time for the patient uh, instead of coming to the hospital. Uh, we can diagnose the illness uh, at home and then offer the necessary treatment or ask them to move in an ambulance uh, which has an ambulance uh, monitoring system to the hospital nearby. So all these things make life easier for the patient, reduce costs, and very, very convenient. Can you imagine someone in IAM having a heart attack and going to Manipal Hospital? I think they would be dead three times by the time they reach Manipal Hospital. Whereas if you had a device, then the physicians at our ER could have diagnosed a heart attack, our ambulance could be here, and the treatment could start in the ambulance. And of course, we should promote local innovation. Some of these things have happened, like the Chitra Valves, the Arvind, the Islands, the Kalam, and so on, are just tense, but we still have a long way to go. Training of non-doctors in the field of nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, so on and so forth, I think is something that we should encourage. Unfortunately, some of us in the doctor's fraternity itself are blocking this because we want to protect our turf. And in summary, we need to have the four A's in healthcare. Availability, very, very importantly, affordability, accessibility, and acceptability. India desperately needs a holistic care system, healthcare system that is universally accessible and affordable and at the same time effectively reduces the out-of-pocket expenditure. Invest in pre preventive and primary health care. Promote wellness rather than treat illness. This is a concept that we have uh, borrowed from the US and we should come out of it. We are uh, investing heavily on uh, hospitals to treat illness, very little promotion of wellness. Incentivize rural health care, universal insurance coverage, Reduce cost of healthcare by innovation and local technology, less customs duties, public private partners, especially in the tertiary and quaternary care, promote corporate social responsibility in healthcare. And in conclusion, obviously the government should increase healthcare spending. And finally, everyone concerned, the society, the bureaucracy, the government should believe that healthcare is a fundamental right and it should be demanded by the people of this country. And if it's not provided, the concerned who have not provided it should face the wrath of the people and face the consequences of this violation of the fundamental right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.